If there's a right way to do something, then there's usually a wrong way. Luckily, many tasks limit the effects of attempting something the wrong way. For example, there are very few things that one can do to improperly turn on a light switch. Unfortunately, landing an airplane does not fall into such a simplified category. Mastering the normal landing, much less any of the variations on the technique, such as short field and soft field landings, is challenging. Every pilot throughout training and during routine flights will encounter the numerous difficulties known as faulty approaches and landings. While this video will contain content on how to recognize and recover from a variety of situations, one cannot stress enough the importance of recognizing when to perform a go-around. Landings are not meant to be saved. With the immense number of variables present in any given approach, pilots are tasked with evaluating and correcting any changes that occur in the approach path. Generally, minor corrections are required. If at any time the approach becomes unstable, major corrections are required, or the pilot feels they should go around, an immediate go-around maneuver should be executed. Novice and experienced pilots alike should rely on the stabilized approach criteria. As experience is gained, pilots will also develop a sixth sense for go-arounds, but sometimes fail to execute this maneuver anyway. Trust this sense. While situations and errors with an approach and landing are truly infinite, analysis and experience has led the FAA to group some of the most common issues into 15 sections in the Airplane Flying Handbook. This first podcast in the series, Faulty Approaches and Landings, will begin with four of these sections. Low Final Approach, High Final Approach, Slow Final Approach, and Floating During Roundout. Each of these possible errors, low, high, slow, and floating, share the common thread of energy management during the approach and landing phase. In a simple mechanical system, there are two forms of mechanical energy to consider, potential and kinetic. According to the law of conservation of energy, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred between types of energy. No system is perfect in terms of these conversions. Potential energy is the energy of position, the aircraft's altitude. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, airspeed for the pilot. In a perfect system, the sum of these two forms will equal the total energy available. Glider pilots absolutely live by the knowledge that a pilot can exchange airspeed for altitude or altitude for airspeed. Because of the energy expended during the production of lift and overcoming drag, these exchanges are not perfect, and there will always be a net loss in energy available for altitude and airspeed over time. In a powered aircraft, the engine converts the energy stored in fuel into mechanical energy to make up for these losses during level flight. During the approach, the pilot is controlling the exchange of energy so that kinetic energy directed towards the ground is at a minimum when potential energy reaches zero, which would basically be when the aircraft contacts the ground. To do this, the pilot controls drag, or the configuration, power, airspeed, and altitude. Although situations are limitless, there are a finite number of tools the pilot can work with. Pitch, power, and flaps. With this in mind, let's analyze some of the situations a pilot will face relating to energy management. The Airplane Flying Handbook mentions a number of reasons why the pilot could be positioned well below the proper final approach path. Base leg too low, insufficient power, landing flaps extended early, misjudged wind. Loss of obstruction clearance and the inability to make the runway are two major hazards of flying too low of an approach. If a pilot attempts to recover from this situation incorrectly, it could also result in a low altitude stall. To avoid these hazards, it is critical to recognize and correct for an approach before it becomes too low and too much potential energy is lost. 
Recognizing a low approach is best accomplished by referencing visual glide path indicators such as the VASI or PAPI. During the day, a secondary reference could be the appearance of the runway numbers. If they appear squished and difficult to read, you're definitely too low. If the runway lacks these references, then it's important to know from experience how the proper glide path appears and the altitudes and distances expected during the approach. While I personally preach using an aim point, this reference will not directly tell you if you are high or low. It will only indicate if you are flying to a specific spot on the runway. If the aiming point rises in the windscreen, the aircraft is flying short of that position. Trust your instincts and do not hesitate to go around if necessary. Now, what if a go around is not necessary and the aircraft is only slightly low? Then the pilot must adjust to re-establish the aircraft on the proper glide path. In terms of energy, slightly low means that there is not enough potential energy. To fix this, energy must be exchanged and added to get back to the proper glide path. Because the aircraft is on the back side of the power curve, speed will decrease rapidly for any increase in pitch. To account for this, power should be increased for any increase in pitch. Even if speed is just slightly high, there will likely need to be an increase in power, even if it's only a small increase. Once the proper approach path is intercepted, pitch and power must be readjusted to stay on the approach. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the high final approach. In this case, potential energy is too great. While high final approaches provide greater obstruction clearance, an approach that is too high can lead to overshooting the runway or end in an attempt to dive for the runway at the last moment. Like the low approach, pilots easily recognize high approaches by referencing the visual glide path indicators. Again, experience and use of an aiming point will guide a pilot to recognize the situation early and determine if the expected touchdown point will be made. If the aiming point lowers in the windscreen, the aircraft will overshoot the expected touchdown point. Once recognized, it will be important to quickly correct for the excess energy. If flaps can be increased, the extra drag will steepen the approach path. In many training aircraft, the change in downwash from the flaps will increase the angle of attack on the tail and requires a change in control pressures. If flaps are already at the desired setting, the next option is decreasing power. A reduction in power requires lowering pitch to maintain the appropriate airspeed. Once on the proper approach path, increase power to avoid transitioning to a low approach. The Airplane Flying Handbook warns of excessive sink rates and defines an excessive sink rate of greater than 800 to 1,000 feet per minute. If such a rate is experienced at low altitude, the best course of action is to go around. During normal landings, the recommended approach speed is published in the POH or, lacking this reference, generally about 1.3 times your power off stall speed. This gives an adequate buffer from stall without excessive speed brought into the roundout. If the approach is made too slow, the aircraft will be operating precariously close to stall and in an attitude that makes it difficult for the pilot to properly judge altitude and sink rate for the timing of the roundout. Depending on pitch and control usage, the aircraft may stall or sink rapidly. Recognizing deviations from the appropriate airspeed is easily accomplished by reference to the airspeed indicator. This should be a quick reference, however, as fixation on the airspeed indicator during an approach can be just as dangerous as flying the improper speed. Other references, such as noise, control feel, and appearance can also give clues as to the pilot's speed management. When it becomes apparent that an approach is too slow, the pilot should immediately increase power to reduce the sink rate, prevent stall, and accelerate the aircraft. If the aircraft is on the proper approach path, but slow, increasing power and some increase in forward pressure to re-establish airspeed is required. If slow and low, maintain pitch attitude while the aircraft accelerates until re-intercepting the proper approach path. There is a point where the pilot must determine if a go-around is the safest course of action.
There used to be a saying in aviation that went something like, add five knots for friends and family. That was meant to help grease the landing. The only problem is that approaches made too fast will likely cause floating and directional control issues. The appropriate airspeed for the conditions derived from the POH, as well as environmental issues such as gust factor, must be considered and followed. Once the pilot determines that the approach is too fast, reducing power and increasing pitch will help reduce speed. The increased attitude will help slow the aircraft while the power reduction will help prevent too much altitude from being gained. If too much airspeed is carried into the roundout, the aircraft will float. This means that the aircraft hangs in ground effect while the pilot attempts to achieve the proper touchdown attitude. If the aircraft is forced onto the ground, a number of other hazards such as poor directional control, perhaps a bounce, a balloon, or wheelbarrowing on the nose wheel can occur. If there is a crosswind, the extra time spent in the roundout compounds all of these problems, not to mention the extra runway used during this time. Properly correcting this situation requires careful judgment of speed and height. The pilot must continue the roundout and establish the proper landing attitude before touching down. In doing this, the pilot will overshoot the intended landing point. The Airplane Flying Handbook stresses, if a landing cannot be made on the first third of the runway or the airplane drifts sideways, the pilot should execute a go-around. This video has included a number of techniques for recovering from various energy mismanagement situations that can occur during the approach and landing phase. Not enough emphasis can be placed on going around should the approach become unstable or unsafe. Sometimes the best landing starts with a well-executed go-around. The success of each of these recoveries is dependent upon starting from a stabilized approach. With all this said, the trick is not to overthink the approach. Develop and then trust your instincts. Aerodynamic knowledge and understanding are tools to accelerate this development of skill. Pilot judgment must be carefully crafted and developed so you can continue to have fun and fly safe.